CC glue gun is found under the generate category, and this is a pretty surprising effect. If I apply it to this picture of some gumballs, it's going to just completely disappear because this effect generates on top of whatever you apply it to. So I'm actually going to delete that and make a new adjustment layer. This isn't totally necessary, but I think it makes a little bit more sense this way. So I'm just gonna apply it to that adjustment layer. Everything goes black, it's actually transparent. And nothing is gonna show up until we go to the first property of brush position, which is just a point control. And as I move that, if I get rid of my overlays, you can see part of my image is showing up through that point. I'm gonna set a keyframe on that brush position and then go forward a little bit in time and move it. And immediately a line is drawn between those two points, but it's based on the colors of the layers beneath this adjustment layer. So I'm just gonna move this around a little bit, go forward in time, add another spot. And now that I have three keyframes, you can see that it's interpolating between these three points with a little bit of easing. It's more like a Bezier curve rather than just a linear point to point line. So I'll just add one more down here and then go forward and we'll end it right here. So if I play this back, it's drawing this line on between those points, again, automatically adding in those Bezier curves. Now, if I select all these keyframes and say easy ease them all, nothing is going to change except the timing. It's not gonna change the way that the curves are shaped. And if I select these keyframes in the middle, right click and go down to Rove Across Time, which is off screen, but Rove Across Time will make those keyframes automatically space out so that we have consistent velocity between all of these keyframes as this point travels throughout the motion path. So if I play this back, it's all gonna be consistent now. Again, it didn't change anything about the shape of this path, just how long it took for that point to travel through it. And easy easing these two keyframes, again, won't do anything except ease the actual speed of that point. So there's really not much that I can do to shape this path, at least not natively. But if I add a null object by going up to layer, new null object, and I'll call this brush tip, and then press P to bring up the position, I'll grab the property pick whip for the brush position and drag it to the position of the brush tip and let go. Now these keyframes that I've set mean nothing because it's being driven by the position of the null object. So again, I'll set a keyframe for the position of the null object, move forward a little bit, add in some more points, and see what we can do with this now. Since it's being driven by this null object, I have the ability to actually shape the motion path now. So I can curve this out a little bit more, and I might need to update which frame I'm on to get that to actually show in the comp sometimes. But now I'll be able to shape this to the motion path and be much more precise with the way that it looks. So now I have this drawing out exactly the way that I want it. I'm again gonna rove across time for those middle keyframes and add some easing to the starting and ending keyframes. So let's just pull these out. And now this path travels much more quickly in the center than it does on either end. So preview this. We've got this line being generated around that motion path and we now have complete control over the look of that shape. Okay, so that's the brush position, but what else can we do with this? Well, again, if we zoom in, you can see inside this line is a basically warped view of the layers underneath it, of all of these gumballs. So if I go to the stroke width, I can increase that and it becomes much more apparent where that texture is coming from. I can go to the density and turn this down and then it's basically going to turn into little blobs that kind of meld into each other like some of the other CC effects. So if you wanted to give your line a little bit more texture, you could turn that down. I'm gonna keep that pretty high. Next up is time span, and this is measured in seconds. If it's set to zero, then it's going to just draw the line out and the line will always stay there. But as soon as I increase this, even just a little bit, then it's going to have a lifespan basically for each one of these blobs. So let me play this back and you'll see that it's now trailing off kind of like trim paths, but it's doing it in a very kind of organic way. If we go to the very end, you'll see that it kind of shrinks down at the end. The blobs don't just get trimmed off, they're actually slimming down. So that's actually a really convenient way of doing this type of animation without having to bring any trim paths into the situation. It's not exactly vector, but we are using the motion path, which is just like vector paths, and it has a very unique look. I'm gonna reset that time span back down to zero just so we have that line continually. And then we'll look at reflection. By default, it's set to 100, but I can turn that up to be higher and it's going to basically distort the reflection more. And if I turn it all the way down to zero, we'll have no distortion at all. This is basically now just a mat revealing what's behind it. So use that reflection to shape how the texture is actually being warped. I'll reset that back to 100. 
Next up is strength. And this is kind of like the likelihood of these blobs sticking together. So let me zoom in here again, turn the strength down. And as I do this, you see that the blobs are getting smaller and smaller. And right here where the paths overlap, it's much thicker. And if I combine this with the density, turning down the density, it's gonna start breaking apart. So maybe that strength is too low. I'll increase that a bit, but then turn the density way down. So we have much more individual blobs. And if you play with the ratio between these two, you're gonna get something that looks a lot more textured or like the material coming out of the brush tip isn't quite so consistent. And that's why this is called CC glue gun. You can kind of think of this like caulk coming out of a caulk tube or toothpaste a fluid that's really thick. And all of these properties can have keyframes. So maybe at the beginning, I wanna have less strength. So I'll turn that down to a very low value and set a keyframe and then move forward a bit and then increase that over time. So that actually might be a little bit too quick. I'm gonna press U to bring up my keyframes, move it forward. And now that's going to kind of like sputter at the beginning before becoming stronger. And again, I'll keyframe that down near the end to have it kind of sputter off. So now it starts a little less dense and ends a little less dense. And I could do the same thing for the density and the stroke width if I wanted to. This is all relative to where the brush tip is in time. So if I wanted to start out with a much smaller stroke width, I'll just set that down to zero and then increase it back up to around where I was. So somewhere around 10. That way it'll be thin at the beginning, thicker in the middle, and actually let's make that even a little bit more thick and then have it taper off again at the end. And maybe I'll have that last a little bit longer as well as the strength, I'll have that last a little bit longer. And now I have this kind of tapered shape. And if I turn up the time span just a little bit, then it's going to disappear after it's been revealed. So there are lots of possibilities if you play around with all of these properties. Next up is the style. If I zoom in here, we have the paint style set to plain, but I could change this to wobbly and that's going to make everything a lot more textured. If I increase the wobble width, you can kind of see what's happening. It's basically giving randomness to the positioning of each blob. So again, if I wanted to, I could have this at a higher value at the beginning, set a keyframe, move forward in time until about here, turn that wobble width all the way down. And if I play this back, you'll notice that this paint style is actually animated. If I zoom in, this makes all of the blobs move around randomly. If I increase the wobble width and height, that's gonna give it more randomness and we'll see a lot more movement. But we also have the ability to change the wobble speed. So if I turn this way down low, they'll move much more subtly. Or if I turn it all the way down, it won't move at all. It'll just have some random positioning. And just like the other properties, these ones are dependent on the timing as well. So if I wanted it to start out pretty spread out, I'll set keyframes for the wobble width and height at this point in time. And then by this point, I'm gonna turn it down to zero. And it's basically gonna go back to where it was with the plain style. So it starts out more textured and becomes a lot more solid at the end. Now, this is kind of weird just revealing a picture of these gumballs and not having anything in the background. So what I wanna do is go to my adjustment layer and add a CC composite effect, uncheck RGB only and change composite original to behind. So what it's doing is taking all of the layers below this before any effects were applied and compositing it behind the previous effects. So now glue gun is showing up on top of the picture that it's using as the texture. And this looks a lot more like a clear liquid now which might not be what you want. So if you wanted to, you could add a CC toner effect between glue gun and composite. I'll leave this set to tritone and then grab my color picker for midtones and maybe choose this hot pink color. And now it'll have that hot pink tint. I could also grab the shadows and maybe add in some pink to that as well so that it becomes really nice and clear what's happening. And you could do any number of effects on top of this. Maybe a drop shadow will make it stand out just a little bit more. I could increase the feathering a little bit, maybe make that a little darker. But now we can see that nice and clearly on top of the texture. I could also change how reflective this material is, or at least how clear the reflection is, just by adding a fast box blur before CC glue gun. So I'm going to blur out the original prior to the glue gun effect. And what this does is basically makes a more matte material, something that's a little bit more rough, that doesn't reflect so perfectly. So the more blurry this becomes, the more matte the material is. You could do it very subtly, or really crank it up to make something smooth. And maybe that would be a better look that wouldn't need the CC toner after it 
to help it stand out a little bit better. Of course, you don't have to use the same texture on the foreground as the background. You could apply CC glue gun directly to a different layer completely so that it uses it as the reflection and then composite that on top of a completely different layer. So if I just pressed E to bring up all the effects, selected them all, copied and pasted them on top of the gumball photo and actually got rid of that CC composite. Now we have a layer just on top of this green background. I probably don't need that drop shadow anymore. I don't have to have CC toner, but I kind of like the way that that makes it a little easier to look at. And that's going to now be composited on top of whatever I put in my comp. So I could bring out my logo now and that will show up on top of it. All right, let me get back to where I was and I'll actually turn off CC toner and drop shadow just so we can focus on what's happening. I'll zoom in and we'll take a look at the light and shading categories. So let me close up style. And it's currently lighting this glue gun effect using the effect light, meaning the light that this effect is actually generating. So I could turn the intensity down lower or higher to make it brighter or dimmer. I could change the light color to anything that I wanted and just tint it. And I could change the light type from distant light to point light. If it's set to distant light, then I have a light height and a light direction. So think of this kind of like the sun, something that's very far away and it's a very directional light. So. I could raise this up so that it's basically shining directly at what we're looking at, or I could lower it kind of like the sun's going down in the horizon. And then I can use the light direction to change where that light source is coming from radially. So if it's at negative 45, it's coming from the top left corner and shining downwards. I can make that a little brighter so it's easier to see. If I go to positive 45, then it's gonna be coming from the top right corner. The point light type is a little bit different. It gives me a point control that I can move around and this is more like a light bulb. So if I put it right here, we're gonna get light cast out in all directions around that point. I can still control the light color and intensity as well as the light height. So I can kind of push this further through my scene or pull it out closer to our point of view, but that's it for the point light type. But if we go back to the top of this section, we can change this from using the effect light to AE lights. So what this allows us to do is use native lights in After Effects. So if I go up to layer, new light, and I make a point light, click OK, and then move this around in Z space, you can see that it's actually lighting the effect. I could increase the intensity of the light to make it show up a little bit more. I could go into the light options and change the color to be something completely different, and that will affect the glue gun effect. And I might wanna go in and add another light and this time make it an ambient light, turn it down to around 40% and click OK, and that will fill in some of the darker areas. So the benefit of this method is that these lights will interact not only with the effect, but any 3D layers or effects that support 3D lights in my scene. The effect itself is not 3D, so if I added in a 3D camera, it's not going to actually move around and support that 3D space, just the lighting. Okay, I'm gonna change that back to effect light, close up the lighting, change the light type to distant light, and then collapse the light section so we can take a look at the shading. This is where our glue material actually interacts with the light. So I could turn the ambient down and it's going to basically get rid of all of that fill light. I could increase or decrease the diffuse. So maybe if I turn that ambient down, I'm probably gonna to wanna to increase that diffuse. Specular is at its maximum, but if I turn it down, you can see that's this highlighted edge basically, so how intense that highlight is. The roughness property makes more or less of that glue reflective or have that specular highlight. And then metal just changes the shape of that specular a little bit. But those are all the controls for the glue gun effect. Like I said, it's a very unique effect, one that you probably wouldn't think to try and use all that often, but it has some very unique properties and can create some pretty interesting results so it's definitely worth checking out yourself. But that's everything you need to know about CC Glue Gun. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then check out the other ones here on my YouTube channel. And if you like my teaching style, then definitely check out my longer form content on Skillshare and School of Motion. And if you wanna support more tutorials like this one, check out my Patreon. You can find links for all that stuff in the description of this video.